Welcome to year two of the Funding Love Podcast. I'm Mallory Elrod. And I'm Caitlin Duckworth. We are two adoptive moms that seek to love, support, and elevate all corners of the adoption triad, including adoptive families, adoptees, and birth parents. We do that through honest conversation with both expert and everyday voices about all things adoption and more all while running our nonprofit, Funding Love. We create post-adoption experiences that strengthen bonds, build community, and restore people. We are Funding Love, the podcast. Hey guys, it's your co-host, Kate. Thank you for joining us today for episode 95 of the Funding Love podcast. Today we have Julie McGee with us. Julie is a mom, a wife, an author, and an adoptee who is passionate about sharing her story for others. She shares with us her journey of finding her biological family, including all the roadblocks and twists and turns that came with that journey. Something cool is that she's an identical twin, which is definitely a fun part of her story. We are so, so grateful Julie joined us on the show and even more grateful she was so open with us about her story. We talk about this on the show, but she is an author of three books and they are books you for sure need to put on your must read list. Anyways, I know y'all are going to love her just like we do. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back to the Funding Love Podcast, and welcome, Julie. Thank you so much for being our guest and joining us today. We are so excited for this interview. Well, I'm glad to be here, too. Awesome. Oh, my gosh. Mal and I were talking before. uh, She did a lot of the conversations with you to kind of book this episode, and so I... I don't really know much about your story, so I feel like I'm I'm like on the edge of my seat because I know it'll be just such a cool story for our listeners, and I'm going to hear it for the first time as well. So, so I'm excited. Yes. So, why don't you share with our listeners how you are connected with the adoption community? Okay. Um, well, I'm an adoptee, an adult adoptee, obviously, but I'm also an identical twin, and so that adds a whole different perspective to being adopted. Um, but also it added a great dimension to uh, my adoption search, which didn't start until I was 48 years old. That's crazy. Yeah. So being an identical twin, did you grow up with your sister? Yes, uh, I was adopted through Catholic Charities, and they have a very firm policy of placing um, multiples with uh, the same family. And back in the day, so I'm from uh, the the closed adoption era, also called the baby scoop Mm. era, because there were Mm -hmm. so many Mm -hmm. uh, white babies available for adoption. Um, For the listeners that are younger than me, it's mostly was driven by um, the lack of birth control and the Catholic church and communities um, was pretty unsafe to have abortions at that time. So there were tons of uh, white women that um, maybe didn't have the best sexual education mm-hmm. and found themselves with an unplanned pregnancy, hence just so many, many babies available for adoption. So that's a little history. But Catholic Charities um, placed my sister and I in the same family. And then my younger brother, not biologically related, um, was adopted two years later. And then, like so often happens with couples that have infertility issues, my parents had three biological oh, kids. So there were six of us, um, big Irish Catholic family. And I never had the sense that, um, you know, there were any favorites or different rules. We all had allowances and chores and the same punishments if we did something we weren't supposed to be doing. Um, My parents, every once in a while, would pull my sister and I in to the living room for a little chat about adoption and, you know, tell us how much they had waited uh, for such a long time, how much they wanted us. And I truly, um, that was a genuine emotion. But the one thing that they would always say was, if you ever decide you want to search for some of your history, uh, we'll help Mm -hmm. you. And uh, fast forward to what happened when I turned 48, I had a breast biopsy and the the laws were changing in the U.S. Fortunately for me in Illinois, um, uh, we had, we gained access to our original birth records and my health issue really pushed my sister and I into this search. And one of the biggest, um, 
obstacles we faced was getting our adoption papers from our parents who had never given them to us. And um, my mom was less than happy that I was going down this path. Wow. So mm-hmm. um, a lot of conflict right off the bat, the health issue, my mom not supporting me, um, and then lots of things that happened along the way, which we'll get into, I'm sure. Yes. So this story is told in your book that I read. I I had it on Audible and man, I just like cruised through it. It was so great. I love your writing style. It really, there was times when I was having to remind myself like, this is her life story because you wrote it so beautifully. It felt like I was just reading a novel. And, um, but it's called Twice a Daughter, A Search for Identity, Family and Belonging. That's the, the book that I read. And, um, yeah, your story was really compelling. And I think that a lot of adoptees can probably relate to, especially in that area of that baby scoop area of, you know, struggling to find, um, biology, your biological family. And so I, I found it interesting too, that it was your husband that kind of pushed you to reach out and to find your biological family as well. Once like the health scare stuff came in. Um, so yeah. And I think, I think I needed that push. Um, We had tried when we were 30 years old, we sent a letter to Catholic Charities asking for information, and they told us there's nothing we can share at that at that time. Um, But like I said, the timing was perfect. Um, I had the health issue I needed to figure out if breast cancer ran in my family, although I did end up having breast cancer. Um, it just set everybody on warning. My my twin sister has a daughter. I have three daughters. There were a lot of good reasons why my husband pushed me into doing Mm. that. Um, And it's, you know, life comes full circle. I was always a journaler growing Mm. up. So I did a lot of writing for myself, but not for other people. And the more people I told about what was going on with my adoption search, they were like, you have to write this down. It is just the craziest story. And um, I was almost done raising my four kids. They were close to being out of the house. And I thought, why not? I'll, I'll figure out how to write a book, signed up for a lot of writing classes. And um, wow, I'm so grateful. The The adoption search was one yeah. thing, figuring out my adoption history and making connection with birth relatives. Um, but now it's also launched this whole second career of speaking out about adoption and, and uh, writing, writing. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Now I'm curious... Yeah. Because you said when you were 48 is when you began that search for your biological family. In all of that time in between, was there ever anything in you that desired to find that at a younger age? Or was it something that you just were kind of content where you were and you didn't really think about the need for it? Or where where was that? Did you feel any internal struggle there or any leaning? There was always a curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um my sister and I, like adoptees, often do develop uh, a fantasy yeah. um, about who our birth parents were and what happened and, and why we were um, placed for adoption. I like to use that phrase, placed for adoption versus oh, yeah. given mm-hmm. up, um, yes. which uh, was kind of a closed adoption era uh, phrase. But um yeah, so we always had this curiosity, and I'll, I'll just share the fantasy, um, because we didn't know anybody other than our brother that was adopted, um, and it wasn't an era when you sat down with social workers and, and talked through your questions, um, and we just once in a while had these chats with our parents. So between the two of us, we determined that our parents must have been teenagers, and um, we liked the idea that maybe she was the had cheerleader and he was the hot football player. And uh, for some reason, that fantasy seemed to settle us. Um, we didn't have a strong urge to get going and, and figure this all out. And I really think the reason that was, was because we had each mm-hmm. other. I mean, mm-hmm. I am so blessed to have been a uh, place for adoption with a full sibling. And I think that has been fundamental in how my sister and I developed. Certainly our parents' love and support was another factor, but to have um, a twin going through life is just an incredible thing. We always got along. We um, kind of like the yin and yang 
I like to say we're um, like a passenger driver situation. Sometimes I let her take the lead and, you know, figure out what to get mom for Christmas or whatever. And then other times like this adoption search, it was me that um, instigated that and took the lead. I was the one that went and sat with my parents and explained to them, you know, this is a health issue. I need the papers. I need to go find my birth family or something just to find out what's in my past. And um, she wasn't with me when I did that. She had to have her own conversation, but it was me taking that first step. And that's kind of been our relationship through life. Mm. One of us takes charge and the other one goes, okay, go for it. Gosh, what a blessing to have each other. Truly, like you said. For sure. What a comfort. Yeah. Yeah. And And what's so interesting, subsequent to having written this book, and I'm very active on social media, I've had five sets of adopted twins through Catholic Charities contact me. And I always, I always wondered, are there other ones like us out there? And there are. And um, it's been a a really fascinating um, aspect to the, the whole journey. Wow. Yeah, that is really cool to find that link in that community even. Um, but so tell us a little bit more about like the fantasies though, because I know that in the story you, you do find your biological family, your birth mom and your birth dad is kind of like a, a longer story. But how was it when you were reconciling those differences of like, this is what I grew up making up in my mind. They were the high school sweethearts. They were, you know, the quarterback and the cheerleader. And then when you learn like the real story, was that hard to reconcile those two pieces? Yes, it was because I was more forgiving of them having been this madly in love teenage couple than I was finding out that they were 26 years old and adults and the whole story behind that. So that was a big surprise. I think, um, you know, to have adults having to make that decision, it felt um, less impulsive and more deliberate Mm. and Mm. also a little more hurtful Mm. that they couldn't figure it out as adults. Um, Right. uh, It wasn't careers or uh, the the willingness to go to college and kind of improve their life circumstances. Um, Mm -hmm. They couldn't figure it out. Another thing that came out of the uh, the search, which I'm still struggling as an identity piece to uh, wrap my hands around it, is I found out, I, I mean, I was placed in a family that was Irish Catholic and German. Um, I found out that, you know, that was the case with both of my birth parents. They either were Irish and Catholic and German, or um, my birth father was Protestant, which was part of the issue. But he was also Native American. Mm and uh, Native American heritage. So um, I'm still trying to figure out what I think about that. Um, I didn't grow up with any Native American friends. Um, I think in the time period that my birth parents met, being Native American was a secret, Mm. something that you hid because it Mm. wasn't uh, favorable. So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I'm, I'm enough Native American that my children could have used that uh, to get into college. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. What, but wow. here's an interesting fact, um, because my birth father's name is not on my birth certificate, which is perfectly legal back then. I cannot claim to be Native American. So another another door oh my gosh. slammed in my face. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, and things have changed so much. So I'm assuming back then um, the adoption process, even having Native American in your blood was different because we – so current, my – youngest son we brought home through adoption and he is also native american but in order to complete his adoption we had to not only get you know birth parents to sign papers but we had to get his tribes as well right that he belonged to to approve that but i'm assuming back then maybe that wasn't a thing no yeah no i think it was completely glossed over yeah wow wow Yeah. So there's just lots of things to reconcile. And so was that ever like a fear too, or a thought in the back of your mind that maybe kept you from 
searching for your birth family. Like I, I would, I think I have heard other adoptees like express like they don't really sometimes want to know. Like it's easier yeah, to I not think know that than that is, to know. Is that something that uh, you thought? No, I think we were very happy and content in the life that we were leading with our parents. And I think when you know you can't know something, you just shove it in a little drawer and you compartmentalize it and uh, you rationalize, well, I just can't know that. And then all of a sudden I could know. And it was so liberating and powerful. Um, And I think it's too bad. I mean, given, given that, open adoption is so prevalent now and that people so much younger than me have access to more information about themselves. It's so sad that the laws are Mm. still so strict in so many states. Um, Mm. Young people can have access to their family or information, but people my age still can't. Um, And and that is really still very hard to reconcile, that right to privacy versus that right to know. Right. Yes. And you even used a portion. We had a guest on last week who is an adult adoptee, and she found her parents through Ancestry. And you used a DNA type thing. Was it 23andMe? I used both. And I I loved listening to your episode last week because um, it brings up a really important point. For some adoptees, you know, accessing these genealogical uh, sites is helpful. Um, For other people, it's not helpful. And so you have to figure out your own route to get to where you want to go. Back in when I was searching, the databases were not that good with 23andMe Mm. and Ancestry. So I was matching with third, fourth, and fifth cousins. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've only recently been able to match with first cousins, um, which, I mean, I had already made contact with them. Um, but my siblings that I find in my story, twice a daughter, they are not people that would ever be on a, a site like that. I never would have connected with them mm. um, if I hadn't done my search my way, the way it right. unfolded. So that's a sort of important point for your listeners that um, it may or may not help you. And, you know, finding your own path to get there, if you're so inclined, is um, is an individual thing. Yes. Yeah, I feel like the search, I like listening to, to you talk and thinking back to Carla's episode last week, there's just, I, I would imagine there would be quite a bit of like uh, excitement yet fear, because say you do match and you, you find a lead and you go down that lead, and then it leads you to a feeling of rejection. Like that has to be like, mm-hmm. you're so excited because you find something, but but then you're like still left maybe feeling empty or maybe more empty. So uh, my my right. my question to you is, is in your journey, how did you cope with those feelings? And what advice would you give to another adoptee who's in that place in that search? You know, um, I I think there is a lot of caution to, to place in connecting through those sites. I benefited it from having an intermediary. And I would, I would ask most of the listeners to consider that because my intermediary not only was able to communicate with my birth mom, but she was also able to counsel her and get her over some of her fears. She also counseled me as to what to expect. Um, And almost everything that she said, you know, be open-minded. It might not happen today. It could take her a long time to get used to the idea of having you back in your life. Um, and that did happen. I had received substantial rejection from her in the beginning, which came out of fear. She was mm-hmm. afraid this whole chapter in her life was going to come back. My birth father, all the ugliness that happened between them about not getting married in the end, um, she needed a lot of time to deal with that. And I didn't know, I mean, it's like walking into a movie half over. I didn't know anything that had come before that. And once she got over her fear, the intermediary coached her on, this is how we can do this. You can exchange letters and pictures with the girls. Then if that feels right, 
you can talk on the phone. And if that feels right, you can schedule an in-meeting person. So I truly benefited from that social worker that was helping us um, manage our reunion. Same social worker um, was not very helpful in finding my birth father um, because my birth mom gave us the wrong name for him. Oh, Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah. You had quite a few twists and turns in in reconnecting with him. But I do love that you were able to find, I think you had mentioned before, some biological siblings. So do you want to share that part? I I will. I won't share how um, we're connected in case anybody wants to read the story. Sure. Yes. But um, so I had this rift going on with my adoptive mom about the search. She just really could not open her heart to the fact that I needed to do this. Also out of fear, I'm, a, I'm certain. Um, and I was always proving to herself that, to her, that our relationship was not going to change. You know, I think my attitude was, I have four kids. Each time I had a child, I would thought, oh, how could I love another child as much as this one? And then they were here and I love them just as much. <laughs> and so true. I, I say to my, my mom, I, my heart is big enough for two yeah. mothers. You're always going to be my It doesn't mom. take from your pot of love. Nothing. It doesn't. It no, it doesn't. It, yeah. it doesn't. Huh. Yes. Um, and I have a funny story about that later. So, um, oh, what was your original question? I'm sorry. Oh, just the fact that you had met biological siblings that you didn't even know. Oh, okay. Had. So I, yes. I, I get this phone call and it's, uh, my, my half brother and we do the who do you know thing. And, uh, we figure out this connection that we have, meaning we already know each other, but peripherally. Wow. And the connection that we had, um, when I told my mom and dad, they were like, Oh my God gosh, you got to be kidding. We have to get together. So this healing, I'll use my term, the God moment Mm -hmm. went from, I don't want you doing this to this is great. Let's all get together. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) It was such a healing moment. And because it was a healing moment for my mom and also for me, because our relationship improved, she's now gotten to the place and it's been 14 years later, uh, where she'll say, how's your birth mom? Oh, I love it. How's she doing? Oh, wow. That's how's awesome. her health? So the, for the listeners, you know, it can get really, really ugly with this stuff, but um, be patient. Uh, find the right people to help you. I had a support group that I used through Catholic Charities Post-Adoption Support Group. And I was in the room with birth parents, adoptive parents, and other adoptees like me. All of us were trying to figure out how to make connection and why, you know, our our birth relatives wouldn't meet with us or whatever. But that afforded me the opportunity to really understand my birth mom. Um, And I I think adoptees in general, I think your listener, your um, guest last week also shared this compassion for her birth mom. And I think we do realize, I mean, certainly adoptees have a loss of identity that we're grappling with. And adoptive parents, for whatever reason, have some kind of loss that they're dealing with in building their family. But birth moms across the board have so much pain and anguish around the circumstances of placing a child for adoption and their loss of relationship with the guy, um, and their loss of relationship with their child. So um, I think we do come out on the side of, wow, um, they're special people, and they've made so many people's lives better. Um, and they do deserve a little bit of honor. Yeah, I mean, at, so, at the yes, end of the day, there's absolutely. you have a heart connection with her that that you mm-hmm. can't deny because it's biological. So I think that that grace is kind of built in. And I think that that is so cool to recognize that, you know, just like Carla said last week, she can can have perspective for that, just like you're sharing. That is so cool. Yeah. And, and like Carly said last week, I mean, her adoptive mom is her mom. Yeah. Mine mm-hmm. too. 
that that's mom. And I would never call my birth mom, mom. I call mm-hmm. her by her first mm-hmm. name and uh, did from the very first Got day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So, so at the end of your book, and you just touched on it, but I know that you went to the support groups all throughout that time when you were in the search and like going through that part of your story. But it said towards the end that you still continued even after I um, still attending do. the support groups. Yeah. So, I mean, how important do you think it is for adoptees to, to find that support? I feel like when you're in our role at Funding Love and we're supporting adoptive families, which and supports adoptees when they're young, um, and then we support birth moms, but I feel like people kind of glaze over an adult adoptee like support system. So how important do you think that that is for adult adoptees to find that kind I, of support? I think it's huge. I think it's huge. Um, we support one another. We uh, support birth mothers in kind of feeling better about what happened to them and, and maybe what, what an adoptee thinks. Um, also, ad- adoptive parents benefit from that too. What is what is my adoptive child thinking when they're a teenager? Well, they're having fantasies. <laughs> um, or, you know, they're struggling with feeling belonging here, but feeling a little bit curiosity there. And where is the loyalty? And um, mm. I think that loyalty is a big issue why adoptees choose or not to choose to search. And whatever they decide is the right thing, of course. Um yeah. My my question to you, I kind of want to go back, is I I have heard this before from other adult adoptees, is their fear to search is they don't want their adoptive parents to be upset, just like you dealt with that roadblock. Now I I don't want to like I wouldn't want to say, hey, it's your life, you fig you you need to know what you gotta do, so bulldoze through your parents' feelings and they'll get over it because you care about your parents. So my my question, I guess, what would you say to somebody who's maybe like, okay, I don't want to look because I don't want my mom to be upset. I don't want her feelings to be hurt. I don't want to, I don't know, like, how would you encourage them? What would you say to them? Well, um, there's several uh, adoptees that I yeah. know that waited until their uh, adoptive parents passed mm-hmm. away and then started on the wow. search, knowing full well that, you know, they might find them both deceased as well. Um, that was a decision that they were comfortable okay. with. Um, I I may have gone down that path too if um, my husband hadn't insisted and the health issue hadn't presented itself. Oddly enough, the health issues all went away after I finished my search. Um, and my twin sister never had the same health issues that I did. So whether that was a vehicle sure. for change, whether that was the universe telling me, okay, you got to figure this out. There's this big path for you to still go on. Um, I don't know. I, but I do think that that support system that I found through Catholic Charities, and it's not everywhere. I think the bigger um, adoption agency, agencies have that vehicle in place. It's still supports me in the sense that I feel an obligation to people that are struggling with this decision yeah. or struggling with the process to offer my advice and counsel. It's my giving mm-hmm. back. Um, Catholic Charities mm-hmm. uh, was advocated for me when I was an infant to keep me with my sister. And then here they are full circle back towards the middle of my life still advocating to um, help with the adoption process. And I think um, whether you decide to search or not, it's a really wonderful place to to sit with people that are like you mm. um, in this adoption triad to understand what you think um, and understand the perspectives of the other players in the triad. Yeah, I think that's good because I don't think, just like Carla said, if you don't want to search, you don't have to. If you're okay where you are, you don't have to. Um, Or if you want to do Mm -hmm. it later in life, like you're saying, that is okay too. There's no right or wrong. But Mm -hmm. having that community with another adoptee feels to be a key thing. Just to process it, even if there's what ifs to say, look, it's okay. I did this. You don't have to. Or talk about the fantasies. I think that's that's so cool that you, you, you do that. And and the adoptive parents come to that okay. too to support their um, adopted child, and I think they learn something too sure. about their own child, 
but about also the perspectives of everybody else. So it Mm -hmm. benefits so many people. For sure. I think a lot of adoptive parents need to hear that. They need to hear an adult adoptee say, if I find my biological family, it doesn't make you less of my family. It doesn't mean that I don't love you the same or that you are not my mom. Like I feel like adoptive families need to sit in those circles too to grow their own perspectives and you know, there's just fear. All of it. There's fear there it when is, you're it when is. your it's child all makes based. that connection. It's yeah. like, well, how do I fit in with yeah. this? And yeah. um yeah, that uncertainty of how it's gonna play out is is tough on everybody. Yeah. Yes, for sure. So you have written a lot in your life. You you mentioned before you've had blogs and you've had done essays and articles. And um, the book that I read is The Twice a Daughter, A Search for Identity, Family, and Belonging. But you have another book called Belonging Matters, Conversations on Adoption, Family, and Kinship. And then you have Twice a Family, a memoir of love, loss, and sisterhood that will be coming out next year. So why don't you tell us a little bit about each of those books, I've only read one of them. I'm going to have to go pick up the other two because, like I said, they are – your writing style is – I just loved it. It was uh, so easy to read, and it was really engaging, and I was just drawn into your story. So how are the other two books? Are they the same – are are they the similar story, or what are those books about? Tell us about um, those. Well, so Belonging Matters rose out of um, essays and blogs and published articles that I wrote during Twice a Daughter. Um, and after. So there's conversations, you know, that were tough with my adoptive mom or things that have happened with my birth mom that um, I had to address some secondary rejection issues, things like that. And then also family stories, um, because I think those boundaries of who is your family um, is something that we need to examine. For example, I have a, a favorite aunt. She's not my aunt. She's my parents' dearest um, friends, but we called her aunt and I consider her family. So I think those boundaries between kinship and family is blurred and um, certainly being adopted makes that even more so. Um, so belonging matters are essays um, that I compiled through from the last uh, five, six okay. years. Okay. And then having written Twice a Daughter, a lot of my readers are like, well, we want to know what happened before this. So that's what Twice a Family is going to be about. It's um, it's about being raised in this blended family with my twin sister. Um, I lost a sibling when I was a teenager. My youngest sister mm-hmm. died suddenly. There's a lot about that. Um, okay. So it's family building. Love issues it. and okay. um um you know how families within that are struggling how they survive and and what are the common threats in doing that that's wow. awesome well Those congratulations honestly on on yes. all of these books and uh i'm i'm excited to line them all up and go through them myself now that i feel like i have so much more uh knowledge of who you are and the story of and i feel like i You remind me of so many people from where I grew up. You said Irish Catholic families. That is like where I grew up in the Midwest. So Irish Catholic families everywhere, Catholic schools. I mean, I feel like you are somebody like I that I already know from my hometown. Uh, (laughs) But anyways, we really, really, Julie, appreciate you coming on this podcast, being vulnerable, sharing your heart. All of these, I know, personal stories um, you've been so open with. So we're so grateful for you. Thank you. Thanks. It's been it's been fun talking with you ladies and I and I love your podcast. I love the guests oh, that you bring awesome. up. So it's a good diverse first group of topics and people. Awesome. Well, thank you for awesome. yeah, thank you well, for saying you. that. But here at Funding Love Podcast, we like to end each episode with a little extra love. So before we go, share with us one thing in your life that you are loving right now. What is bringing you joy in this season? Um so I developed a, a strong meditation really? practice, 20 minutes, twice wow. a day. Um, I started this a while ago and um, I, I have, it's like religion to me. I do it every single day, twice a day. Um, it's a, it's like a little mini nap for your brain and it helps me refocus, recenter. Um, I try to do it before I write because it's amazing what comes out when your brain's resting, um, an idea Mm. or creativity 
pops out. So um, that would be my suggestion to readers in the new year to um, to try meditation. Meditation is not easy. What, wow. I feel like it's, a, it, no, it's like a hard. practice. It, it, like it really is a practice to be, to get good at it. Yeah. And your, and your brain gets used to yeah. it and your body will tell you, okay, I'm tired. Yeah. I either need a nap or I need you to you do your do meditation. Right? Do you use like a guided meditation, like an app or anything? No, just, just, you. no, um, no, I, I, I did transcendental, transcendental meditation training oh, wow. with my husband. Oh, wow. So I have a personal mantra and um, we learned all the phys- physiological things that happen to your brain when you do meditation. It's like both sides of the brain start to work oh together and synapses that were kind of dying off are now like reconnecting. So, oh, wow. Um, we'll see if that wards up all summers. Yeah, I'm this is like a whole, so. whole other episode hey. here. I'm so curious. Um, but that is awesome. Yes. That is so cool. And uh, so once again, Julie, thank you. We are so grateful. And thank you listeners for tuning in to this episode of the Funding Love Podcast. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Funding Love Podcast. We are a crowdfunded nonprofit, which means that people like you can help make a lasting impact in the lives of adoptive families and birth moms. At Funding Love, we create post-adoption experiences that strengthen bonds, build community, and restore people. And when you partner with us, whether that is giving online, signing up to become a monthly donor, or simply buying merchandise from our shop, you are Funding Love.